Hello, welcome back to Rooftop Talks. So recently, I think I passed my one year anniversary of being a vegan advocate. So this is someone who is actively spreading the vegan message, trying to convert people, um, joining groups like Anonymous for the Voiceless, We the Free, Earthlings Experience. I've done a whole lot of learning in this year and um, I think it could be useful to other people. So the first thing, and this is something that really was difficult for me to understand and come to terms with, is that you won't be able to change a specific person as a vegan advocate, okay? So basically, on a large scale, like a top-down map of populations, people are quite easy to predict. Like you can predict how things are moving. You can see social movements grow. You can see certain behavioral patterns. However, on an individual level, it is almost impossible to predict who in this example is going to go vegan and when they're going to go vegan. It is basically impossible to predict. And this is a difficult thing to come to terms with because the first people I wanted to persuade to become vegan were my family and I thought to myself well my family are the exact kind of people who would go vegan right they're educated normal caring compassionate people with vegan values they care about animals they like animals someone just scored a goal <laughs> I didn't realize there was a football game on, but someone just scored a goal. I'm hearing loads of cheers all around me. Okay, let me uh, collect my thought, my train of thought. So I thought, ah, if anyone's to go vegan, it would be my family. But unfortunately, you just cannot control who is gonna go vegan. And statistically speaking, unfortunately, if you are a, a, a vegan who's recently gone vegan, your family and your close friends are statistically quite unlikely to go vegan. And you might think that because you are a vegan and you're close to them and you have an influence over them, that that would be a factor in, in the equation and that maybe you can persuade them to go vegan. And while that is true, that can also have the opposite effect. The fact that you are your mother's child, your father's child, your brother's younger brother, that creates a power dynamic where it's actually quite difficult for them to listen to you in an impartial way, in a calm, relaxed way, without that power dynamic playing a part in their decision making. For example, your father is naturally just ahead of you on the hierarchy. Your father's meant to have this identity of knowing more than you. So it's going to be difficult for your father to admit that his son got to it first, got to this conclusion first. You know, your father's seen you as a young boy and seen you dabble in lots of different things, a lot of things that weren't really important, that didn't really matter. And so when it comes to veganism, it's like, well, maybe it's just another one of his phases, you see? How is he to know which one is serious and which one isn't? And this is a tough thing to communicate. And actually, if you're living in the same household as someone, that creates a, a situation where they cannot escape and they know that they cannot escape and that unsettles them. So if you start talking about something that they think that they are ideologically opposed to, they're going to get this anxiety very quickly where they believe that they can't escape from this uh, conversation and that is going to probably create some hostility. Whereas if you're on the streets, which is what I do, I, I outreach people on the streets, um, with certain groups, we're only talking to people of the population who come to us, who actually approach us and ask what it is we're doing. And so it, there's already this kind of self-selecting um, process going on before we even talk to someone. They have kind of selected themselves as being open-minded people. And from there, they can have a conversation with someone where there are no stakes, there is no power dynamic yet. They can just freely express their thoughts, and then they can walk away from the conversation without it having affected one of their close relationships. So it's actually kind of a level playing field and it's more comfortable for people. You are 
therefore far more likely to convert a complete stranger than you are your close family member. And this has been really, really tough for me to get to terms with and for my wife to come to terms with her family because her family also has those members that are not vegan, that are not on board with the vegan message. And it's really difficult because this is something that we take very seriously that affects us. And it's really hard for us to understand that for some people it's just not on their radar yet and that they're not at a point in their lives yet where they're not ready to contemplate these really dark aspects of our society that we're all playing a part in. They're not ready for that to be kind of pulled out. And that brings me on to another point, which is that we should be regarding most non-vegans, at least the ones that aren't complete anti-vegans, the ones that are indifferent or whatever, we should be regarding them in our own minds as being future vegans. This is something that's really helped me to think of people, just internally, I don't tell them this, but I think it of them. I think, it's okay, you're a future vegan. It's a bit premature for you maybe, um, but I can plant a seed right now, a seed of, a seed of doubt in your mind about the uh, status quo that using animals um, is actually problematic, deeply problematic and that is not in line with our values as decent human beings. That has helped instill in me a patience for people who are just not on the same page as me yet. That being said, that doesn't extend to anti-vegans. I do make a distinction between non-vegans and anti-vegans. Anti-vegans are simply actively opposed to veganism. They are involved in spreading misinformation about veganism. They are involved in sabotaging vegan movements and vegan efforts. They actively oppose the spread of this peaceful uh, way of life, this peaceful moral obligation. And for those people, they have something wrong with them. Um, I'm just going to say it like it is. I, I, I know, I know. But it, they do, they have something wrong with them. And I'm not gonna play psychologist and, and get to the bottom of that. But what I will do is give you this advice. The vegan movement can be successful without the participation of anti-vegans. We can move on ahead as a social justice movement, as a community, without these uh, <laughs> problematic characters who are, for whatever reason, whatever rhyme or reason, have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, which is where animals are enslaved and subjugated and exploited. How do I know this? Well, I'm a student of history, and for all the social movements I see, I'll give you an example. African slaves were emancipated many, many, many years ago many, 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 many years ago. In this current year, 2024, do racists still exist? Yes. Okay, but legally speaking, do ethnic minorities have equal rights? Yes. Now that is something that needs to be maintained. Eternal liberty requires eternal vigilance. Eternal security requires eternal vigilance. We must maintain that and we must work to maintain rights, the rights of all people. Once we get animal rights, we will have to work to maintain it, unfortunately. But that is a historical example of how a society can move on, can progress without the 100% consensus of the entire population. The same thing for uh, the Equal Pay Act in the 1970s. I don't remember what date, but in the UK there was the Equal Pay Act and it came out in the 1970s where women what? legally have to be paid equal in their job to that of a man. That is not to say that there isn't systemic uh, discrimination among the sexes. There most certainly is. But in terms of legislation, that was a landmark moment in equality. Same goes for the right to vote, the right for half the population, women, to vote. 
Do misogynists still exist today in 2024? You bet your ass they do. They're everywhere. There are lots of misogynists. Society was able to move past this. They were able to progress without a 100% consensus. Now, I don't know the exact number for what we need in terms of a social progress movement, a social movement, but I bet that it would surprise all of us how little of the population we actually need to give us a serious fighting chance of having animal rights enshrined in law. I don't think it's as much as you expect. And I tell myself this and I tell you this because first of all, it gives me hope. But second of all, it reminds me not to waste so much time on anti-vegans. Now, anti-vegans, part of their whole method, whether this is subconscious or conscious, I don't know, but part of their whole method is to waste our time so that we are less effective. Don't give them that. In one lengthy conversation where you're t going back and forth about crop deaths with an anti-vegan who is a, using, employing all kinds of sophistry to um, disparage and detract from the animal rights message. During that time, you could have outreached five ordinary non-vegans and convinced at least one of them to go vegan. And that is a lifetime of difference. Uh, that is one less person in the population who is perpetuating this system financially. It's a way better use of your time. And this is why I think Anonymous for the Voiceless um, with Paul Bashir. Paul Bashir has the right way of going about this, in my opinion. He says, don't waste your time on anti-vegans. Once you've identified someone as an anti-vegan, move on. There's hundreds of people walking past on the street. Move on. Don't engage with them too much. There is an exception to that. And the exception to that is if you are in the presence of a lot of people, if this is a kind of forum where there are a lot of onlookers, a lot of people who haven't had their minds made up and they want to hear both sides and an anti-vegan is yap, yap, yapping about all the different fallacious claims and, and detractions and, and counter arguments, counter arguments that they're making. It might be worth engaging in that debate. It might be worth tackling those in the presence of people who haven't made their minds up. And that is in fact one method that you see a lot on social media and what's working really well for a lot of the vegan activists. These arguments do really well to convert people because with a lot of these anti-vegans you get to see just how poorly thought out their position really is. They're not very good. <laughs> They're not very good. Anti-vegans usually stick to one or two kind of dilemmas, you know, um, that aren't actually dilemmas, straw man arguments, some kind of nirvana fallacy, an appeal to futility, something along those lines. And that brings me to another point. As a vegan advocate, you will receive a lot of advice from unconverted non-vegans on how you should be doing your advocacy. Despite the fact that they are not in the animal rights movement at all, they will be happy to prescribe lots of advice on the best way to communicate your message. Don't listen to them because they have a vested interest in telling you a method that doesn't affect them. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to leave them alone. And they're saying, oh, you know, what you should be doing is going into your own little corner of the internet away from me, away from everyone else, and just be talking about it amongst yourselves. Now, of course, that's never going to convert anyone and they're never going to see it again. They're never going to be confronted with the moral dilemma ever again. And that's the point. That's why they prescribed that to you, because they don't want to be reminded of their problematic daily habits uh, that are affecting the lives 
of unnamed, unseen animals. So who should you listen to when it comes to advocacy? Well, there are some good voices out there, but if you really want to take it back to first principles, to the core of who you should be listening to, you should always be asking what would the animals want? Because that's who you're doing it for. You are trying to liberate the animals from the oppression of mankind. For me, I have this imaginary friend. She's this big, giant, beautiful, uh, round goddess. She's a pig. <laughs> She's like the grandmother of all pigs. And I can always have a conversation with her about what it is I need to do or how, how I should put this across, what I should say. And she gives me very good advice because she's the grandmother of all pigs. She sees not only the pigs that are existing here and now who are in the gestation crates, the ones who are in the line to the slaughterhouse, the ones who are kept in a filthy shed, neglected, uh, the ones who are contained and confined and all they want all day is to go out and roam in the forest. She can see them all, but not only in the here and now, but also future generations, the generations that are yet to be born. She sees them. She sees the long line out into the future, the long lineage that is yet to come, that is yet to experience this kind of subjugation and exploitation and suffering and enslavement. She sees them all. She's the grandmother of all pigs. I mean, that's just an example. For, for pigs, you can also have chickens, horses, uh, cows, um, rabbits <laughs> you can have them all right you can have one of each they could have a little council meeting in your head i usually come out with a pretty pure answer and that's why i'm making this series rooftop talks is because what they said was you are not creating enough content my man you need to get out there and, and get your ideas out there and it doesn't matter if there's no polish to these videos it doesn't matter that there, there's no time in your day to edit because you have a full-time job just get them out there, you know, like, just get these ideas out there into the world and maybe someone will listen and you can chop them up into micro content and you never know, one of them might take off, someone might hear it and it might change them, it might change the way they see things. That's who I'm listening to, it seems to be working. Here's another thing, little hot tip for you. A future vegan can look like anyone. That's what I've learned from doing outreach on the street is that you never want to write someone off by looking at them, by their appearance, and say, oh, he's never gonna go vegan, or she's never gonna go vegan. You'll see some, like, some really old geezer who's like working class background, who is wearing a tweed jacket or something, and you're like, this guy's never gonna change. Like, he's, all, he's still wearing tweed. But then he talks and he's like, you know what? You've convinced me. It, within five minutes, you know, you, you just, do not know, never judge appearances when it comes to outreach, never judge someone's appearances. The kind of characters that go vegan on the spot and you're like, I never would have guessed. And it's really hopeful as well, that's really encouraging. For people who are maybe not quite as outgoing as me that don't wanna have so many in-person conversations, there are lots of different ways you can do like passive activism as a vegan in a small way helping the vegan cause without actually having to talk to someone directly. One of them is just wearing like a vegan t-shirt, like wear some kind of thing that signifies that you're vegan. For one thing, it will help you make friends in the vegan community because people will notice and they'll be like, oh, you're vegan, wow. It makes it normal, it reinforces the norm. Also wearing a shirt to the gym is great because we want to show people that vegans have energy, that vegans are athletic, that vegans can take care of their bodies. And people will see that and they'll recognize it. And you don't even have to talk to them, but they'll see that's a vegan going out to the gym. That's a vegan who's getting a promotion at work. You know, that, that's a vegan who's doing sports. We want vegans to occupy every level, every community, every subcategory, every subgenre of everything. We want them everywhere. 
and you will find yourself at a certain place in a certain community and just represent represent veganism it's great a lot about being a vegan advocate is about being a good role model and in this way it's kind of helped me in life in general because i now have a very deep motivation to be a good role model because my identity is attached to veganism so the way i conduct myself the way i carry myself through life um there's stakes to it you know like let's say imagine if i got into a fight with someone in public and we it came to blows not only would the risk of that be my own health but as a vegan the risk of that is that people associate that with veganism now so the stakes are higher in being a role model for others it's always going to be for the animals but it just keeps on surprising me with how many amazing hidden benefits there are to being a vegan that can change your life for the better um veganism changed my life and if you're listening to this and you're curious and you're not a vegan i think you should give it a go try it for a long time um because some of these benefits you only realize like a year into being a vegan i think question 3 are you a good person oh holy shit <laughs> Okay. Can we stop the test? <laughs> You're a walking lie detector and I just realized this is a fucking minefield. No. We can't stop. <laughs> Are you a good person? Yeah. I think so.